Hello out there in Radio Land. This is Michael. This is the Street Preacher's Corner Podcast. The podcast where the easily distracted go to feel better about themselves. Well, here we are in Mark Lesson 28. And I am surprised that uh, we're still doing this. And I'm surprised that anyone's still listening. I'm just, I just live life in a constant state of surprise. Sort of. Sometimes. So Mark Lesson uh, 28. We're going to be back, here. we're still in Mark 4. I am making a career out of Mark 4, apparently. And uh, a little more light in this subject here than what we're doing. I guess not. Uh, Mark, lesson 4, now, or 20. So, so verse 24 is where we're going to be at. Now, now we covered a little bit of this last time um, we did this. I'm going to read verse 24. And he said to them, Take heed what ye hear, with what measure you met, it should be measured to you, and unto you that hear shall more be given. <clears throat> now we covered the first part of that verse before, and I stopped uh, where I did because I understand um, that that verse right there is a rabbit hole all its own, a uh, rabbit nest all its own. Um, I don't think rabbits have nests, actually. Now I say that. I think they have... I mean, everybody says rabbit hole. You know, we had this rabbit. Uh, speaking of the easily distracted, so 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 we had these rabbits, and I don't know why we had them, uh, because to me, rabbits are food. But to my wife and my daughter, they had these expensive rabbits that apparently were terribly delicate, had not been bred to survive. They'd been bred to look pretty or something. I, I don't know. You had to take these rabbits. You had to brush their hair, and you couldn't let them get wet, and they couldn't get too hot, and they couldn't get too cold, and they were just these useless animals. Now, they still, you know, defecated as much as any other rabbit, and still, you know, all that still had the same. So it wasn't like these were, you know, plastic rabbits that were just, they were ornamental, but they're, anyway. So these rabbits started dying off because, you know, they weren't, they weren't bred to survive, I guess. And so we had one left, and because of different medical situations going on in my family, I wound up taking care of this ridiculous animal who is very poorly equipped to survive. Don't care about him. Really, there's not enough meat on him to even bother eating him. He's just there. Or I guess I guess it was a she. I don't know what it was. It didn't tell me. So, uh, I don't know. Like, two weeks ago, this rabbit gets out. We have a little, uh, little uh, uh, hutch. Not Starsky, just hutch. We had a little hutch in the front porch, and uh, the rabbit got out. And somehow made it past three, you know, 100-pound dogs and made it out of the fence and made it into the larger world. And I was like, well... Praise the Lord, I have nothing else to take care of. And then the neighbors began to call us and uh, across the road here. So they across the, across the, I'm pointing like you can see where I'm pointing. And uh, the, um, <clears throat> they called us and they're like, hey, this, I think this rabbit is yours. And, it's, and I was like, uh, what? what rabbit? Is, you know. So my wife sends me over there to go try to capture this rabbit. Okay. Now, one of the things that makes this rabbit very poorly uh, bred to survive is it is white. <laughs> So yeah, this it's got some black on it too, but it's primarily white. It is a white rabbit in the woods, where everything eats rabbits. And so, uh, you know, the neighbor said, "Hey, this thing's in our yard. What are you gonna do about it?" And I went over there, and of course, when it saw me, it ran into deeper into the woods. And I'm gonna put some food out there, but it's walking around chest deep in food. It's got no reason to climb into this little cage and eat this rabbit food. Um, so, um. I went over there one or two or three times to make my wife happy, even set up a little trap to hope to catch the rabbit. And then that just, yeah, I mean, it's it's not coming back. But I, I happen to pull out of this driveway every morning, and I see this rabbit because it's white in the woods, and it somehow managed to survive and stay away from hawks and snakes and, and coyotes and everything else around here to eat rabbits. Pretty sure that rabbit has a hole, not a nest. There was a point to that. All that. So anyway, uh, verse 24. He said to them, Take heed what you hear. With what measure you met, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. So um, one of the things you got to understand is uh, that verse 24 happens in context with verse 23. You know, which happens in context with the whole parable that we spent like four, four, uh, four meeting or four podcasts doing. Uh, but there is a little shift, it looks like to me anyway, in in, in verse 24, there's a slight shift of, of, of subject matter. 
And so, for example, the phrase is, take heed what you hear. And, and, and why? Why do you take heed uh, to what you hear? Because unto you that hear shall more be given. Now, now uh, I've gone through this a bunch because, well, Jesus goes through this a bunch. But your reaction to God's truth that's made available to you determines whether or not God shows you anything else. And that is uh, both uh, gratifying and slightly terrifying all at once. And so that's part of the that's part of what's going on in verse 24 there. Um, but the but the center of verse 24 is 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 uh, with what measure you met and met is measure. So with what measure you measure, what measure, yeah. Yeah. It shall be measured to you. So I'm going to use this piece of this verse uh, as a springboard. I don't like guys that'll take a piece of a verse and just do whatever. Well, I was in a church service one night, that, and the guy wanted to talk about the Pony Express. and say, what's that guy doing? It has nothing to do with anything. But this guy had read a bunch of stuff on the Pony Express, and he thought he had some really cool stories. And I'm all for really cool stories. And then, you know, I'm not mad at the guy, but, you know, he wasn't preaching the Bible. He was preaching the Pony Express. But to to to, to justify uh, talking about the Pony Express, he had to have some kind of tie-in, right? You just can't get up there and say, hello, thank you for coming to Sunday Union Services. I'd like to tell you about the, the Pony Express. I mean, if you want to do something pointless and silly like that, you get yourself a podcast, right? Anyway, so this guy did that, and so, but he had to find him. So he dug around in Ezra, I think it was, or Esther, yeah, uh uh, somewhere, it, it, one, and he found where this guy had given this other guy a letter, and that was his. That was all the justification he needed. So I don't, I'm not doing that. I'm not taking this little piece of a verse. Uh, it sh, uh, uh, with what measure you met, it should be measured to you. I'm not taking that and using. I mean, I'm using it as a springboard, but I think you'll find that it's a pretty legitimate springboard. So, um, so let's pick up Matthew seven, and I will go ahead and tell you. Matthew 7, verse 1, in my decades of ministry experience. I don't know when I'll have arrived. I've been doing this a while. And I, I, you know, you, you, you reach a point where you know what you're doing. You know you've been doing this a while, and, and you know what you're doing. But at the same time, you don't want to, it's like, yeah, I've got this off. I got this under control. I got this, I got this figured out. I'm, I'm the expert at because no one is, right? But but you know, at some point you got to say, yeah, I know more of what I'm doing than than I did ten years ago or twenty years ago, or whatever. But I will tell you, in my decades of experience, that that Matthew seven verse one is is every lost person. It's their favorite verse. I, I've heard it a million times. But one time we went to Memphis, Tennessee, to preach during the Bill Street Blitz. And, um, you know, the way that works is they block off the streets. I'm going to get to this first, I promise you. Uh, but they block off the streets uh, for like, I don't know, six blocks or something right there on Beale Street. And all the bars, it's a music festival, and all the bars have live music, and, and, and it is just it is just wall-to-wall people. And so uh, Brother brother Ken Lansing, he sets up this thing. If, you're ne- if you've never been, I highly recommend you go. Um, it's a hoot. But anyway, we, we come in with our signs and our banners, and we form up in military ranks, uh, you know, uh, ish, and we uh, and we and we march through this crowd, and then we split off into groups, and we pick different spots of the street. We set up camp, and we preach there. Um. Anyway, so you should you show up there, and you've already got your sign and everything all put together. And um, I'm standing there with a sign. I don't even. It's not the banner that I have now, but it was some sign that had some verse on it. I don't know. Um, I could dig through old photos and probably figure it out, but it doesn't matter. And so I'm standing there. I've not said anything. I've not preached anything yet. And this young girl screams at me, stop judging me. I cannot even do her voice. Um, I hadn't said it. I hadn't judged anything. I hadn't, I'm just standing there with a sign that has a Bible verse on it. And that's just how people react. And so if I've heard it once, I've heard it a million times. They'll say, well, judge not lest you be judged. Judge not lest you be judged. You don't supposed to judge me. And so that's their favorite verse. And so when they say that, uh, the first thing I ask them is, um, do you know where it is? And uh, in twenty something years, no one's ever known where it is. I know where it is because that's that. I mean, I'm, I, you know, it's what you do, right? But 
But not only does nobody ever know what it, where it is, nobody wants to talk about, um, look at it in context. So we're going to do that. Judge not that ye be not judged. For what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. See, I'm not taking that out of context. It ties directly in to uh, Mark 4. So, um, I said, we're going to read the rest of it. So, uh, and, and why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? This is verse 3. And how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thy own, own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So people that don't, that all they know is the Bible says somewhere in there, there's two things that everybody knows. Everybody knows Jesus turned water to wine. And everybody knows the Bible says somewhere in there, judge not lest you be judged. And what they think that means is A, that they're uh, uh, at liberty to do, you know, uh, shots of Jägermeister at 11 o'clock in the morning and, 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 and drink until their intestines bleed because Jesus turned water to wine. And they also think <laughs> that Jesus told me in Matthew 7 to leave them alone. They think judge not lest you be judged is a, is, is a commandment from Jesus for me to leave them alone. And uh, I think that's a little humorous, but it's actually Jesus commanding me <clears throat> and you know, anybody else that's, that's a saved person uh, <clears throat> to, to practice what I preach. That's the commandment because God will hold me to whatever standard that I hold other people to. Okay. That's, <laughs> that's the context of, 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 of Matthew seven. That's the context of Matthew four, but we're going to look at Ephesians five in one hand. Ephesians five. I do this broad, uh, this podcast under various <clears throat> lighting conditions. Because I do it in, in different places, basically, wherever I can find a, a quiet spot where no one's going to come, you know, need me to fix something. And uh, so I'm struggling with low light conditions is where I'm going with this. Ephesians 5, verse 11. Let's back up. Uh, verse 8. Verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Okay, so there are children of disobedience, and the wrath of God comes upon them. Okay, it's not deep theology, basic stuff. Be not therefore takers with them, who? The children of disobedience. So you're not supposed to be partakers of wrong things that are going on. Why? For you were sometimes darkness. <clears throat> you weren't just in the dark. You were the dark. Which makes John 1, 5 kind of interesting. But now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So God has took you from darkness to light. And the scripture commands you to act like it. Okay? <clears throat> For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is acceptable in the Lord. And verse 11. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So, you, so when it comes to works of darkness, uh, rather go judge not lest you be judged. Leave me alone. The commandment to the saved person, to the child of God, is to not partake of those things that are darkness and also to reprove those things that are darkness. And I understand when we say, well, that's just a lost person doing what a lost person does. Sure. I mean, I, I get it. But that doesn't mean it's okay. It is still offensive to God. It is still a sin. It still treasures up wrath against themselves to be revealed in the day of judgment. All that stuff. It's still, and so you have a responsibility to whatever degree you can, to whatever liberty you have, when, whenever opportunity presents itself, to reprove things that are going on around you that are wrong. And man, as our society gets darker and darker and our society gets coarser and coarser, that's harder to have. The liberty is not there that it was in times past. And it just it just wasn't. I mean, I mean, I mean, it's it's a. Uh, it's a vile world we live in. It's getting darker and darker. And so sometimes, you know, just sometimes all it takes, though, is to say, man, you know, you know better than that. And then people that do know better than that will, will realize, you know, I, I'm kind of being an idiot. And uh, I should probably stop. And um, But it is funny to me that people will sometimes apologize uh, for saying a bad word around me or whatever. And, uh, I mean, I don't know why you're apologizing to me because, you know, God can still hear you even when I'm not here. Um, yeah, people, that's the way they are. Uh, the other counterpart to, uh, to, to, uh, Ephesians, uh, 
5.11. It's Colossians, which is yet another book in your New Testament. Colossians. Interestingly, I sometimes have a hard time finding Colossians. It's like jammed up in there somewhere in the Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Colossians. Colossians. Uh... Yeah, 4. That's what I thought. Colossians 4. Say, man, this guy's a rank amateur in the podcasting world. He doesn't know what he's doing. Well, if you if you knew, if you only knew how true that is. Uh, verse, uh, verse 5 and 6. Uh, Walk in wisdom towards them that are without redeeming the time. So you're not just supposed to correct the... the uh, the saved, although that's certainly uh, something that needs to be done. I, I I work with saved people that act like just the wor- they act like just the world, and, and it's and it's 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 uh, it's tough. But walk uh, welcome is toward them that without redeeming the time. Um, verse six: Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. You may know how you ought to answer every man. So so the commandment is: when you see a wrong going on, when you know a wrong going on, you have a responsibility to separate yourself from that wrong. And you also have a responsibility to reprove the people that are doing that wrong, even if they're only doing it because they're lost and they don't know any better. Unless you say something, how are they going to know any better? But when you do that, you have to do it in a gracious way. So the judge not lest you be judged does not mean Jesus told you to leave me alone. I knew a guy one time, he, he said his favorite verse in the Bible was Psalm 1-1. And actually, it's such a ridiculous thing. we got to turn it It was not my notes, but we got to look at this real quick. Psalm 1-1. He said this was his favorite verse. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And this man told me, an intelligent, college-educated man, told me with a straight face that that verse meant that I wasn't supposed to stand in his way when he goes to go sin. I'm not, I'm not, I, that if I want to be blessed, and I see him going to sin, I will get out of the way and let him go do it. That's why prior interpretation is so dangerous. You just think what the Bible says out of whatever cockamamie thing you cook up in your own brain, you, you're going to be, man, you could be crippled to have for crutches for it's over with. So my point in all that was that Matthew 7 is not Jesus telling me to leave people alone. It's actually Jesus commanding me to practice what I preach, like I said. And so, uh, so, you, so, so you, 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 when, you, when you have to correct people, when you have to lay out these issues, when you have to reprove the, the works of darkness and the workers of darkness, uh, you're supposed to not do it. You're, you're supposed to do it uh, from a position of not being a hypocrite. And you're also supposed to do it from, from the position of Galatians 6.1. There are two things I found that the world cannot stand. The world cannot stand a Christian who is a hypocrite. And the world cannot stand a Christian who is not a hypocrite. Different groups of people are driven insane by one of those two conditions for vastly different reasons. And that is another sermon for another time. But in Galatians 6, one, we're told, brethren... If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one of the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So you're supposed to reprove things that are that are that are uh, bad, inappropriate. You're supposed to reprove them with grace. You're supposed to reprove them from a position of not being a hypocrite, because whatever standard you hold them to, God will hold you to, and you're also supposed to do it. With the, in the back of your mind, be hey, I, I, I gotta, I gotta deal with the situation. I have to, I have to address the situation, but I can't come down too hard on this guy because he's made the same dirt I am, and the trouble he's in now, I could be in that same trouble later on. I know street preachers. I know a guy right now. I could tell you his name. That get out on the street and say, "I'm not a sinner like you." I know guys that that preach that they haven't sinned since they've been saved. And friend, your 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 loyal and obedient host is not one of those fellows. I am capable of anything you're capable of. 
I'm capable of anything that anybody else is capable of. I am made of the same kind of dirt as you. And when you go out in this world and you have to deal with situations, you got to keep that in mind. And like I said, you also have to keep in mind that whatever thing you put somebody else under, you are, you are going to be held to the same standard. And so you can't be a hypocrite. Right is right, wrong is wrong. Mike Easter says, we must all look up to the truth, even if sometimes we can't live up to the truth. It's not an excuse for bad behavior. Consider this, though. And I stole this example from somebody else. So, there you go. If he, if he didn't want me to steal it, he shouldn't have left it laying around where I could find it. Um, consider we were going to hold a, a, a series of seminars. We don't even say like a church service. We're going to hold a series of seminars on the importance of of fidelity in your marriage, the, the importance of, 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 or the, the wickedness and the horrors and damage caused by infidelity and how you ought to be true to your wife and her own, right? And as our speaker, we're going to bring in former president of the United States, Bill Clinton. Now, Bill Clinton could go through the Bible and Bill Clinton could find the verses and Bill Clinton could get up there and say, a bunch of stuff that is actually true. But nobody would pay him any mind because we all know what Bill Clinton is. So it's the same thing with you, the same thing with me. Whatever we're going to have to address, then we have to make sure we're not involved in it. And if that means I can't address this right now because I've got to sort this out between me and the Lord and get the victory of this thing, then that's the way it goes. Because like I said, whatever measure you met out, that is what is God is going to hold you to. So, so if you want to do something for Jesus, you have to you have to know right, and you also have to do right. And the way you know right is that you take heed to what you hear. Whatever you dish out, that's what God gives you. Now, if you want to see one of the greatest, hmm, is that the right word? We'll go with it. If you want to see one of the greatest rope a dope, you know what a rope a dope is. So Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay is what I like to call him. But anyway. <laughs> he's old and dead. He's not going to punch me in the face for getting his name wrong. Um, Cassius Clay had a thing where he'd call, he'd called rope a dope, and it was a technique used in boxing where, to where you would basically just uh, uh, tie your opponent up and let him wear himself out and then set him up for the fall, right? And so uh, the one of the greatest rope a dopes in history is in 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, it is a story that you are probably rather familiar with. Maybe, I mean, you should be. I mean, 2 Samuel 12, the context in 2 Samuel 12, what's going on is David has had a dalliance with Bathsheba, who was the wife of one of his generals, and then he had that general killed. The baby is on the way, it's David's baby, to cover it all up, he has her husband killed, and then he marries her. And so as far as David is concerned, Everything is under the rug. Everything's in the clear. They're going to have the baby. People are going to think it's David's or they're going to think it's Uriah's or whatever they're going to think. The baby's there and, and he can partake of, of, of Bathsheba as often as he wants. And uh, all is goodness and light except first, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. And we got to do some extensive reading here. So just buckle in. Um, and the Lord sent Nathan unto David. I've always wondered if this Nathan was, was David's son, Nathan. It doesn't say. Anyway. And he came unto him, and he said unto him, There were two men in one city, one rich and one the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing, save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd, to dress for the wayfaring man that was coming to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house, and thy master's wives, and thy bosom. And I gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have moreover given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the command of the Lord to do evil in his sight? 
Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. So here's why I say that's one of the great rope dopes in history. Um, so God lays out, you know, through Nathan, this, this scenario. And the scenario is just like David's scenario. It is David's scenario. And then he says to David, what do you think ought to be done? And David's reaction proves that he knows what ought to be done. He knows if that happened, he knows what the right answer is. And, and, and his, 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 his anger is genuine. His response is genuine. And, and, and then he finds out that that story is about him. And so God put David under the punishment that David himself suggested. If you go through the rest of David's life, yeah, that man should be fourfold. If you look at how many, kids, how many of David's kids died, four. And David loses the kingdom. I mean, his grandson's a blooming idiot and splits the kingdom and all this terrible stuff happens and so much bloodshed and, and everything that David accomplished gets undone. And all of that was David's idea, David's suggestion. And so God held David to the standard that David held somebody else to. And I think one of the scariest verses in the Bible is, Verse 12, for thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. And I got a whole message I preach on, on, on how God, how, why God responded that way to David. But I'll, let me just put in this little, this little blurb from it, is that when God was done with David, everybody in Israel and all the Philistines knew that God had gotten involved in that thing and that God was not pleased and that whatever David had done, David had done as David. David had not done as God's servant David. And all the world knew that God did not play. God will kill you over his reputation. But you want to see another one? Matthew 21, I think is where it's at. He said, Mike, this got nothing to do with Mark 4. It's got everything to do with Mark 4. Because whatever you dish out, that's what God's gonna that, that's what God's gonna give you. Matthew 21, I believe, is where we're at. Starting about verse 33. Hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent two other, ser or serv other servants more than the first, and they did it unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent to them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. When the husbandmen saw the son, they said amongst themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. Let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord therefore the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto these husbandmen? So that's the question Jesus asks. They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and he will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their due season or in their seasons. Jesus saith unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same as become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall in this stone shall be broken. On whosoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. So one of the takeaways from all that is if God ever asked you your opinion, 
It is not because he needs it. So Jesus says, okay, so, uh, you know, uh, this guy has sent these people and sent these people and sent these people and he mistreated those people and then they send the son and they kill the son. What should he do to the people that killed all his other servants and killed his son? Oh, and the Pharisees knew exactly what should have been done to somebody that did something like that. And then Jesus says, that's exactly what's going to happen to you. What measure you met, the same should be measured out unto you. Wild, wild stuff. So verse twenty so Mark four, verse twenty-five. You know, I've known God for twenty-eight years, I guess now. Nineteen ninety five, this is twenty twenty three, twenty eight years, yeah. So June to be or April will be twenty eight years that I've been saved and June would have been twenty eight years I've been preaching. And sometimes I feel like I don't know the man at all. Because he is so different than me. If we're not careful, we will create a God in our own image that is not the God of the Bible. And we will deal with him as if as if we were dealing with another man, as if we were dealing so with somebody like us. Maybe somebody a little bigger than us, maybe somebody a little stronger than us, maybe somebody a little smarter than us, but somebody that is fundamentally like us. And that's a grievous, grievous error. Mark 4, I said, verse 25. For he that hath, this is still connected to the same thing. For he that hath to him shall be given, and he that hath not from him shall be taken even that which he hath. So so the, the corresponding um, idea here, the corresponding sentiment here, is there are people, so, okay, big picture is there, you're supposed to take heed to what you hear, because based on what you hear and how you respond to that hearing, God will give you, give you more light or less light, more revelation or less revelation. And you should also take take heed about how you conduct yourself because when you're when you're doing the things that God told you to do, God will hold you to whatever standard that you hold everybody else to. And also <clears throat> these things, the failure to take heed to what you hear, the failure to 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 reprove darkness, the failure to do it in the proper manner, the failure to to hold yourself to the same standard that you hold everybody else. That same, those activities, those failures can cause you to lose something that is rightfully yours. And the corresponding verse to that is Luke 19, I think is what I got. Luke 19. <clears throat> Verse 12, a certain nobleman went to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said to them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to be called unto him, uh, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Just going to stick this in there and say, Jesus is not a socialist. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound has gained ten pounds. He said to him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said, Likewise, then be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept lit up in a napkin. For I fear thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up that which thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he said unto him, this is wild now, if he said unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Sounds a lot like, uh, you know, with whatever measure you met, the same we measure unto you. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then thou gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with ursery. He said to them that stood up by, Take him from him the pound, and give it to him that ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given, 
and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. So, so there's that. So these guys knew some things. I mean, they, they at least had, um, had at least heard, you know, quotation marks, because take heed what you hear. They at least heard what sort of man this master was. And they had an obligation to act in accordance with what they knew and had heard. And the consequences of not doing that is loss. So here's so here's the big wrap up, right? For this for verse twenty five, um, the big wrap up is is you know there's an appeal there. I mean there's a principle there that appeals to the lost and to the saved. A man that rejects the gospel when he hears it, I believe, reduces the chances that he'll hear hear the gospel again, or that it will have have the same effect on him. Because he did not take heed to what he heard. And because he did not take heed to what he heard, God may not let him hear anything else. That's terrifying. That God wants you to be saved. That God sent his son to the cross so you might be saved. That his son endured the contradictions of sinners against himself so that you might be saved. And as big a deal as that is, to the point that the son of God is permanently uh, uh, change. He's not the same person that he was prior to the incarnation. Jesus Christ right now is sitting in a body, a human body on the right hand of God. And he will have that human body forever. And he did not have that human body before the incarnation. So God permanently changed a part of himself because your salvation, and he still has the wounds. It's interesting that uh, chase this rabbit. It is interesting that they are never referred to as scars. They're always referred to as wounds. I, I don't know what that means for sure. But Jesus Christ subjected himself to permanent modification, permanent change, permanent differentness. Because because the sal- because your salvation was that important that it changed God forever. I can't even get my brain around that. But even with that much on the line and that high of a price being paid, God will not deal with you forever about it. And he'll deal with you and he'll deal with you and he'll deal with you and then he'll stop. And he stops dealing with you, you'll just... Carry on, you'll get exactly what you wanted. All those times you rejected him, you'll get exactly what you wanted. So that's the appeal to a lost man. He needs to take care, heed of what he hears. He needs to stop all the noise going on in his head. And when he hears the gospel presented, he needs to stop and think about these things. Examine yourself, whether or not you be in the faith. Consider these things. I tell people, for your own safety, for your own well-being, for your own self-interest you ought to consider your soul this afternoon you ought to consider what your sin is doing to you and what your sin did to jesus christ and jesus christ owes your obedience and he owes your allegiance and he or he deserves your obedience he deserves your your obedience and he deserves your repentance because of what he went through for you you ought to take heed to what you hear if you're lost if you're saved, you ought to take heed to what you hear. Because salvation is like, I'd say step one, it's like step zero. That's the baseline. That's the, that's, that's the entry point and getting, getting onto this wild, crazy ride. And going through for the rest of your life, there are things available to you as a saved person from day one that, that you will never find out about if you don't apply yourself and listen to what God has said to you. And be sensitive to what God is saying. And seek God's voice. And seek God's face. And read God's word. And have fellowship with God. You can be saved and be an idiot. You can be saved and be carnal. You can be saved and never accomplish anything. But that's not the point of this whole thing. You can be a carnal, backslid jerk that mistreats everybody. And God's going to deal with you like you're a carnal, backslid jerk that's mean to everybody. I was thinking about all this stuff going through this. And I'm like, if, if God showed up like 
you know, next to me in the, in this, where I'm at. And, and he said, Mike, listen, uh, there's a situation. I'm just kind of curious what you think about it. And he laid out the situation. I would like to think I'd have enough prayer. And he said, what do you think I ought to do about that? What do you think ought to be done? I would think that my response would be, knowing the verses, I would go, I think you should be very gracious and kind to these people and show them mercy. I would like to think that would be my answer. Because that's what I want. That's what I need. The only way you get that is by giving it out. Because whatever standard you put somebody else on, God's going to hold you to that standard himself. Because that appeals to him and that makes sense to him. And I'm taking a quick peek here to Mark 4 to make sure I covered everything I wanted to cover. And that is how that particular cookie crumbles. Yeah, we're going to stop at 25 because I do not want to get into 26 right now. I It's another parable, but we, 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 we put we, there was a topic that we approached uh, early on in Mark that I then said I'm not ready to talk about this just yet. And then I pushed it down the road, and here we are, four chapters later, it comes up again. So we'll stop there. But thank you for listening, all four of you. This has been uh, the uh, Street Preacher's Corner podcast. I'm Michael, obviously. The easily distracted and the forgetful. And, uh, And as always, I will see you on the other side.